Hello, this is Elizabeth Davis with the League of Women Voters of Portland and you're watching the Video Voters Guide. We, in conjunction with Metro East Community Media, are here to interview candidates running in the May 2020 primary election. With me today is Anna Williams running for State Representative District 52. Welcome, Anna. Hi, thanks. Great, thanks for joining us. I'm gonna jump right in with the first question. So please tell us a little about yourself and why you're running for this office. Sure, so I am a social worker, an academic advisor to students who are getting social work degrees, um, parent to two wonderful boys, and the current state representative for House District 52. Um, I currently live in Hood River. I've lived here for about 11 years. Um, also, prior to living here, I moved around a bunch of other rural states, Wyoming, Kansas, and Montana. Um, and spent a few years advocating for the environment, uh, doing uh, environmental politics. Um, but throughout all of it, I've kind of just been devoted to public service. Um, so while I always imagined I would run for office, I decided after the 2016 election um, that we really needed to see people who lived in their communities and who, you know, didn't actually extra, have extra finances uh, to throw out the campaign um, to represent us, to really understand the struggles of working families and um, represent that at the state level. And so I decided to jump in, um, represent my experience with working with local healthcare organizations, homeless shelters, domestic violence response agencies, um, and um, food access and security for older adults. I just felt like I had a lot to bring to the state um, conversation on that. So. I am running again um, because I the the first session you know there's a lot more to do I've really just sort of learned um, how much more work there is for me to do and and so to continue that work I'd like to be reelected. Okay, great, thanks. So this next question has to do with COVID nineteen. So what challenges have been and will be created by the pandemic to the effective and and efficient administration of Oregon state government and how do you propose to meet those challenges? So this is, I mean, a challenge that no one, well, I think there's one person alive in Oregon today who faced the 1918 flu pandemic. Um, he's 104. Um, and so none of the folks who are leading the state government really have lived experience with a, a public health response of this um, magnitude. And so some of the issues that we're experiencing are, you know, we don't really have a plan in place for remote voting. It's not safe for us to go uh, to Salem and vote in person, um, there's so many high-risk people who are uh, elected leaders in our state, and so really not wanting to put those people or any of our staff at risk by calling an in-person session. Um, our budget wasn't crafted with this in mind, and our budget process, you know, requires that uh, the legislature meet to approve additional funds that could go to the emergency board that then they could spend um, in, a, in a really targeted way to respond to this crisis. So, in a lot of ways, the structure of our state government, while we had prepared for an earthquake or, you know, sort of a short-term physical crisis, we hadn't, never really had a plan in place for a long-term public health crisis. And so, we're learning as we go. Um, some opportunities I see in this is really learning how to focus our uh, response on those who historically have been underrepresented at the state government level um, and making sure that while we're addressing their needs in the short term, such as migrant farm workers who are critical to our food supply structure, um, that those adjustments can continue and can be uh, something that continues to allow them full access to participate in our uh, society even after uh, we go back to whatever our new normal um, life is like. So uh, decoupling healthcare from employment, decoupling um, housing for farm, migrant farm, work, farm workers to their immigration status, those kinds of things are things that we need to figure out now and, and hopefully will set us up to be more responsive to future changes um, that I think we'll continue to see as uh, climate change changes our lived realities over and over again. Great, thanks for the answer. Uh, so traditionally, the legislator has conducted the de decennial redistricting process, which will occur next year. Are you comfortable with the current redistricting process? If not, how would you seek to change it? So we actually got a lot of emails to my office um, in support of an independent commission to manage redistricting. And so I, I put some research into that because it wasn't an idea that I knew much about. Um, California did something similar and, and really struggled to get diverse applicants to participate in their redistricting commission. Um, and um, 
their process has been a little bit fraught. And so while I want to make sure that whatever process we have in place uh, doesn't seem or feel political to people and, and truly is not political, I think we don't really know how to do a voluntary system that reflects the diversity of our state. Um, it's similar when you look at the makeup of the legislature itself. You see uh, an overrepresentation of well-off people and older adults because that's who can afford to volunteer their time to do the public service. Um, and so uh, I think the process that happened 10 years ago was pretty fair. And the reason that happened was because the legislature at the time was split 50-50. Uh, with the supermajority slash super minority that we have right now, I think we need to be very cautious about um, how we structure that redistricting process and make sure that uh, it's A, not political, and B, doesn't, isn't perceived as being political. Those two things are actually somewhat different. And so um, while I supported the process 10 years ago, and I'm not sure that a, pub, uh, a private redistricting or volunteer redistricting committee is the right solution, I think we still need to figure out a fair option to make sure that um, it's truly fair and that uh, all of the different voices that need to be heard at the table are actually there. Great, okay, we've got about a minute and a half left. Uh, so the fourth question is, what are your thoughts on cap and trade proposals intended to mitigate climate change? Are they good, are they a good idea or not and why? In general, I think they're a good idea. Obviously the devil's in the details in terms of how they're crafted and implemented. Um, but the bill that we uh, debated here in Oregon in the last two sessions has actually been bouncing around for about 12 years and has had plenty of public debate and hearings. It was originally a, a Republican proposal at the Oregon State Legislature um, that has been continued to be sort of pro-business focused. And so I do think it's necessary that we add the cost of carbon to the um, profits that companies make if they're emitting quite a bit of carbon in the process. Um, Unfortunately, that's a much more political perspective than I wish it were. So I think we need to keep discussing cap and invest or cap and trade and get to a place where we can put a policy similar to that in place. Okay, great. So um, let's see, we've got about 30 seconds left. I think I'm gonna go ahead and just wrap it up here. Um, so this has been the Video Voters Guide. Thank you for watching. The primary election is Tuesday, May 19th, 2020. Be sure to inform yourself about the candidates and the ballot measure and exercise your right to vote. Thank you.